Um, okay, I'm going to keep an eye out for those that are still getting connected, but let's go ahead and get going here for our event. Um, welcome everyone to Unabridged Bookstore's virtual event space. We're excited that you've decided to join us tonight to celebrate Star Wars Multiverse. Um, we're very excited to have friend of the shop, author Carmel Estrich here tonight to talk about his book. Um, so thank you for joining us. A few things before we get started. If you are joining us from home and have any kind of technical trouble with your Zoom webinar or any questions about Unabridged Bookstore or any of the events that we do here, um, feel free to hit a quick reply to the email invite that you were sent, and I'll be on hand to um, answer that the best I can and make sure that you're enjoying the show tonight. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that that email that you were sent has a link to our website where you can order a copy of the book if you have not already. We do have signed copies available in the shop now, so you want to snatch one of those up so that you can read from home. Um, but again, thank you for joining us. We're very excited tonight to have Carmelo Estrich here. Carmelo is an Associate Professor of Humanities at Columbia College Chicago, where he teaches interdisciplinary humanities and cultural studies from Gilgamesh to Bjork. His scholarship is focused on the artistic production of 20th century Latin America, specifically film literature and visual arts and popular music. And now we're winding that into a study of Star Wars here. So we're very <laughs> excited to hear from him. Joining us to moderate the conversation is Paul Booth, American media scholar and professor of digital communication and media arts at DePaul University. Uh, Paul serves on the editorial board of a number of journals, including Transformative Works and Cultures and the Journal of Fandom Studies. He also oversees the annual DePaul Pop Culture Conference. So thank you to both for joining us tonight here at Unabridged to talk about this book. Um, if you're here in, as an audience member, help me welcome them to the virtual stage. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you, Matt, and thank you, Owen, and thank you, Unabridged. Um, for doing this presentation and for all of the support that you have given me and the book um, from the very beginning. It's, it's, it's really an honor and it's my favorite bookstore in Chicago. So this is awesome. <laughs> very nice. We're so happy to have you. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Well, well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm kind of playing the role of moderator here. So if you do have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A and I can shoot them over to Carmelo. Um, but I want to start with uh, a question that I think is, is central to your book and, and maybe central to the way that you think about Star Wars, Camelo, which is this idea of the multiverse. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what the multiverse is mm -hmm. and, and how you've used that term in describing Star Wars, why that's important to you? I, um, from the very beginning, when I started putting the idea of the book together, I knew that I wanted to do what I'm, what I, what I, what I've been saying. It's an all-inclusive Star Wars. Um, I wanted to move beyond the films. I definitely wanted to move beyond the television and do fiction and do children's books. And and I also wanted to include everything that is fan, everything that is fan produced, because I wanted. I was not so much interested in what the industry produced for consumers, but what everybody produced in, in the world of Star Wars, for the world of Star Wars. Um, I, I was very hesitant about the word multiverse. Um, my, my editors were in love with it before I was in love with it. Um, but I really, I really was intrigued by not necessarily the definition in science, and I was not trying to make a connection with Marvel, but thinking of this sort of multiple universes mm -hmm. in which people, artists, fans, writers, mm -hmm. comic book writers are sort of putting all these heads together to think about the different ways and the different formats, the different platforms in which Star Wars works. There's always been this tendency as sort of focusing on the films because they're the ones that started, they're the ones that are sort of like, you know, there are lots of fans that all they do is just watch the movies and they don't do anything else. Um, and, I, and I'm using the book sort of to say, no, there's a bigger universe than the universe of the films. And I find fascinating the way that all these different platforms talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a perfect system, <laughs> as fans know very well. There are holes everywhere. But it is really interesting to see how the language of comics thinks Star Wars, the language of television thinks Star Wars, the language of cosplay thinks of Star Wars, 
And so I really wanted to have that sort of many, many universe world um, to think about Star Wars and making sure that the fan, the fan production was for me essential. Now, and, and I find this really interesting because, you know, you mentioned you, you don't want to do the Marvel thing, right, of the multiverse. It's not the multiverse you're talking about, but of course, Marvel and Star Wars are both owned by the same company. Yeah. And, and to uh, escaping the kind of larger Disney oversee of this, I think, is, is really interesting. And I, I wonder, could you talk a little bit about how you navigated something like Star Wars's extended universe and the like the old multiverse as opposed to the new multiverse? <laughs> the many multiverses. The many, the multi-multiverse. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I, there's a moment in the book that I talk about this because I think of Star Wars sort of the way ancient Greece thinks of mythology, that there are many versions to a story, that there is not the official version and then the other versions. I think both Disney and Lucasfilm have been very, very interested in creating this division between what's official and what is not. And I very deliberately moved away from that. Um, and I did it by thinking about all these different stories as different versions of the possible story. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, what Lucasfilms and Disney calls legends, for me, they're just another version. Um, you know, Iphigenia in ancient Greece, in one story she dies, in another one she doesn't. And so I, I like the idea that you know, in one version, Leia has three kids, and in another version, she has one. Um, and I'm not really interested, I'm not interested in consistency, because it, in storytelling, there are always different versions. I mean, this is as old as oral traditions. When you have an oral tradition, you have a thousand versions of a story. And so I'm thinking about Star Wars in the same way. And so for some people, it's really difficult to sort of, to bring these together, the legends, the old, the, extent, the expanded universe into the canon. But for me, it's just, it's just one more way of telling the story of Star Wars. And it's really interesting when I started doing the research, I didn't get too much into canon in the book because I realized very quickly that the word canon had been used in a million ways because Lucas kept saying, this is canon, this is not, since like 1985. <laughs> And so it, it, there were just too many layers of that canon. And I just said, no, it's, it's all Star Wars. It's just all Star Wars. Um, and, and to me, the corporate part of Star Wars is only part of it. Mm -hmm. it's well, not, that's it's not the official thing. And that's, I find that so fascinating, right? The idea that you're putting fan work and cosplay and uh, uh, fan creations almost on the same playing field as yeah. the the creators and I, could you talk a little bit about your rationale for that and and how you how you see fan work as making that kind of similar argument maybe the wrong word but story world multiverse that the 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 lucas is doing i think what i find magical about star wars and this is not unique to star wars but it is essential to star wars is that the fans have taken on the creative element of storytelling. And so I always think of cosplaying, cosplay is to me a way of interpreting the story. In the same way that Dave Filoni in Clone Wars is interpreting the prequel and interpreting the original trilogy, he just has a job with Lucasfilm, <laughs> but he's, he's not doing something dissimilar from that. Um, if I could flip the coin, I didn't put this in the book, but it's, it's an interesting notion. You know, when Lucas starts tweaking the original trilogy with all the special editions, to me, it, also, it almost felt like what fans do mm -hmm. when the story doesn't end the way they want it or the character dies and they don't want it to die. And so I actually, the, the, the gesture of Lucas and the special edition sort of, in a way, sort of by flipping it, gave me the, the, the notion that, well, fans are, that's what fans are doing. 
It's just Lucas has the power and the money to make the change. And so fans find a way of becoming, of becoming creatives of Star Wars, but, but are not within the industry itself. And I sort of wanted to create, I don't know, a democracy of creativity in the way that directors or, you know, the novelist Claudia Gray, who has created amazing novels since 2015 in Star Wars, you know, there's a certain Star Wars to Claudia Gray. Well, I think there's a certain Star Wars to cosplayers. And I think there's a cer certain Star Wars to fan filmmakers. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to sort of even the ground a mm. little bit and think of all of them as creatives, as people creating Star Wars, because I think it's true. <laughs> I think it's true. I think it's accurate. And, and of course, I mean, so you mentioned uh, uh, the, the Clone Wars, right? So many people that are working in Star Wars now were fans. Yeah. That, so so it, it's not like they're a bunch of people from outside yeah. Star Wars that are being asked to do this. These, these are fans yep. who are then creating their own version of Star Wars. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and it's it's... You know, Dave Filoni is an excellent example of somebody who was a fan, a rabid fan who cosplayed <laughs> um, and then turns into a creator in the process within Lucasfilm. And so that to me is the, the sort of the generational issues, the generational sort of um, platforms or the cascading of all of these generations watching Star Wars and then creating Star Wars and watching Star Wars and then creating Star Wars. I wanted to expand it to to the fandom at large so you know obviously uh we've got different backgrounds going on here um different <laughs> backgrounds why is star wars why star wars why is that different from other sci-fi texts what drew you to star wars oh me personally yeah well number one i you know i was i was at the impressionable age of 12 when i saw the first one um and i have been I have been a fan for a very long time, but it's really interesting during, it's really funny with the Disney purchase, the creation of Rebels and the sequel trilogy, I sort of decided to start expanding my horizons. I was a bad fan, Paul. I was the movie, I was the movie fan. I, I don't believe it fan. for a second. I don't believe there are bad fans. <laughs> I think there are just different fans. No, I was a very different fan. <laughs> which is typical of Star Wars. And I, I had only seen the movies. I had not really seen anything else. Um, and, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico. Spanish is my first language. So when the novels were published, I was still learning English. So I, that was sort of a world that I had not really attempted. Um, but it was really when I started moving outside of the films that I really started discovering the complexity of Star Wars. Um, there are so many things that television, comics, and fiction has been able to do that the movies just don't do. Um, there's a grittiness to the comics that the movies sort of toy with. There's a, the, the sort of long arc of television of being able to develop characters and, and create this sort of long arc even if it's a five hour film, you can't do it. And so I started realizing that there were many different ways of telling the story of Star Wars and that all these different platforms brought something different. And so I, I remember, uh, I was maybe 2018, 2019, early 2019 thinking, telling a friend of mine, so I was like, I really should write something about it. I don't know what. Um, and then I, I got involved. I was at Star Wars Celebration in Chicago and I met an editor there and I just started telling her sort of my thoughts. Um, and she said, you gotta talk to Rodgers, you gotta talk to this person because blah, 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 blah. And um, it was crazy, in five weeks I got a contract. Wow. From the moment I talked to that editor at Star Wars Celebration to my signing the contract with Rodgers, it was five weeks. That's amazing, like that is amazing. I, I, was, I was in shock. It took me a year and a half to get a contract with my previous book. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in five weeks. Um, and so I, it was really when I moved away from the films and started looking at everything else, that's when I sort of realized, okay, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. 
And so that's, that's, when, it, that's when it became a project. That's mm-hmm. when it became the possibility of a book. Now you you you've broken the book up into sections that are that are not that they're not particularly like media platform based. They're kind of thematic, correct? Um, and and so you you know you've got a a, a chapter on uh, kind of human the the concept of the human. Uh, you've got a I, I've got the book in front of me. You've got a a, <laughs> a chapter on desire war colonialism, right. chapter on gender and sexuality. Do these kind of topics match your own, like as an academic, do you, are these the things that you're interested in? And, and do you, Some is that why you see them in Star Wars or is it something unique to the-, no, the Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. I have never thought about that before. The chapter on war, because of my post-colonial studies background, that was, that, was, that was an easy chapter to write. Uh, I am not a gender study specialist. And so that was very, very new to me. Um, and chapter two, the one about language and hierarchies of life, um, that sort of myself trying to put an anthropology hat on <laughs> without much training on it. Um, the reason why I sort of created those categories rather than thinking about formats Mm-hmm. is that I wanted, to, I wanted to sort of develop a theme, study, examine a theme, and then bring all those different formats onto that topic. Um, it, never, it was never my intention ever to have a chapter on television, a chapter on comics. I was really, because I wanted that multiverse effect. I wanted all of these sort of different interactions about the depiction of war, the depiction of colonialism, the idea of femininity and masculinity in Star Wars, the the almost absent presence of sexualities outside of heteronormative behavior, those kinds of things. um, I was really interested in seeing seeing them thematically and then moving on to the different platforms. But, But not all those chapters are my specialty. Yeah. They, They really are not. Um, the, the, the chapter on, on war and empire, that's closer to what I do. That's closer to what I do. So I, I want to hone in a bit on, on the, something you just mentioned, right? This idea that uh, Star Wars is a very heteronormative kind of narrative. Um, and and I, I'm reminded, you know, I'm reminded of what we were talking about, about fans and how mm-hmm. kind of recent fan work has really shown the kind of uh, uh, Finpo kind of of relationship. And how did you navigate bringing in fan work that was so contradictory, but also so um, uh, engaging and and enlightened? Well, you know, it's interesting because in very recent Star Wars, there's a lot more where we are moving away from sort of that heteronormative form. I'm, I'm just reading Rising Storm, which is a very new novel. And there's, there are two young adults who are sort of a gay couple. Um, and so it's sort of more present now, but for a very long time, it was completely absent. And so in that chapter, one of the things that I, that I noticed is that while, while I'm gonna call it industrial Star Wars, the Disney Lucasfilm Star Wars is shying away or sort of shuffling their feet about it. The fans had no qualms about sort of adding that element into it, uh, sometimes for comedic purpose, sometimes for, for like completely valid sort of an identity politics kind of thing. Um, and so especially in that section, um, I sort of needed the production of fans to be able to think sort of in a larger scale about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Um, While I was writing a book, um, while I was writing the book, um, Star Wars Resistance, which is an animated show on Disney XD was was on. And there was this couple, it was like a bird and a rat. (laughs) Um, And they're business owners and all of that. and, And all of a sudden I'm looking at these people and I'm like, wait a minute and it was sort of it's the official first gay couple in star wars that was done in this this very sort of kiddie kind of television show um but if you see the signs they're all there 
that's very rare in, in screen Star Wars on television and in film. Uh, we got a kiss in Rise of Skywalker without any context at all, but we got the kiss. Um, and so it's really interesting that I sort of needed to depend on what the fans as creators needed to add to it in order to sort of have a larger conversation. Because the, the shorter conversation is Star Wars and sexuality outside of, of heterosexuality is barely present. But as I said, you know, there's more stuff that I have read after I wrote the book that there's a little more presence of it. And, and in recent stuff, there is. In recent stuff, there is. Um, it's not very, um, what's the word? It's not very um, exciting or interesting or complex, but it's there. There's a presence. There's a presence. There's it something. Is, there's it, something. Is, it is Disney, you know? It is Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've noticed a couple more people have joined in, so I'll just uh, remind you, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A and, and I, can, uh, uh, I can shunt them over. Um, while, uh, while we're on the subject of the movies uh, I'm, and fandom, uh, obviously the big uh, media brouhaha about Star Wars over the past few years was the kind of toxic relationship that fans had to The Last Jedi. Yeah. Um, did did you did you talk about that in the book very much? How did you how I, did you navigate that in the writing? I mentioned it. I from the very in, in in the introduction of the book, I I very clearly talk about I am not interested in what's the best movie, what's the worst movie. I, I'm that kind of value judgment was not really interesting to me. That's great for a cocktail, but not for a book. Um, but it was so present. Mm -hmm. that toxicity, toxicity, toxicity um, especially with Last Jedi, that I couldn't ignore it. Um, and so there's a moment in which I talk about sort of relations between men and women in, in, the, in, in all of Star Wars. And I talk about Han and Leia and the bantering that happens um, in the original uh, trilogy. And then I compare it to Poe in Last Jedi um, with Admiral Holdo and all of that ha that happens in there with sort of Poe being the toxic masculine figure um, and making assumptions about who she is and what she can do and all of that. And so what I try to do instead of directly addressing the issue of the fans was to try to understand through the book why the reaction. Um, and, and, and that was a really good example of thinking of the ways in which some people sort of saw, there's always been this language in like podcasts and online about this idea that all that, that Disney is doing is sort of a call to diversity um, and the Me Too generation and all of those things. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is sort of set the context of those kinds of conflicts that are happening in the stories themselves um, and put them in the context of Star Wars in general. And so rather than isolating Poe in Last Jedi, I sort of reminded people, we have this kind of thing with Han Solo and Leia in the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, and in the original trilogy, everything was cute. And in the sequel trilogy, the reaction has been sort of like, whoa, 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 this is, like, this is a Me Too generation gesture. Um, this sort of like blanket statement without really thinking about the narrative, the characters, <laughs> the cockiness of Poe, all of those kinds of things that are sort of part of the story that are really very much part of the story. Um, the other moment that I also talk about is the reaction to the story of Luke Skywalker in Last Jedi. Um, because I think part, part of the issue there is this notion that Star Wars started as a sort of very Manichaean narrative of good and evil. And so there had to be good people and bad people. There had to be the baddies and the heroes. And that's the way, that's the, way the original trilogy worked for the most part. In the prequel trilogy, that starts getting a little fuzzy. And in the sequel trilogy, that goes to hell. Mm. Um, and so I think part of the negative reaction to Luke Skywalker in Last Jedi is this notion that we don't have that good and bad world anymore. 
And so if Poe is a hero, he can never be wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so with Luke Skywalker, it was this whole notion of sort of like, he's our hero. How can he possibly be a cynical person? Mm -hmm. How could he possibly toss the lightsaber? How could he possibly say, the Jedi is over, don't talk to me, leave me alone? Um, and for, I found it fascinating. I, I think Last Jedi is a fascinating film because it shakes you up because it makes you think further with this notion of bad and good, the, 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 the heroes and the baddies, it, it makes it more complex. The books do that beautifully. The novels, the novels are really good at doing that, um, even before the films did it, even before the films did it, so. And novels are, are just inherently very good at deepening and, and bringing in ethical and, and controversial ideas and being able to explore them in a ways that films yes. can't. Very true. Very true. Um, so, but I, but I, I think, I think, I think Lucasfilm feels very protective of the films and seems to give a little more freedom with what happens in, in the stories. Like we get no sex in the movies. We get lots of sex in the novels. Even in young adult novels, we get them like post-sex, like post-coach's bed, cuddling and spooning and all of that. And in Star Wars, <laughs> in the movies, it doesn't happen. So there's, there's something about the movies that there's, there's, there seems to be some guidelines in there that the other, the other formats don't have as much. Uh, we did we get a question in our chat uh, from Greg. Uh, who is um, kind of wants to hear you talk a little bit about how technology has played a part in the Star Wars narrative. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's another book. But, um, but I, think, I think specifically looking at technology in an aspect of storytelling, like from yeah. our, our world, how has technology changed it? Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. The, the Star Trek effect of the phone and all of that stuff. Um, what I was going to say before you said that <laughs> is that one of the interesting things about Star Wars, and this is, this is typical of sci-fi, um, is the idea that technology is always connected to spectacle. Um, and the sort of notion of um, entertainment as distraction. Um, and so to me, the explosions, the battles, the big ships, all of that stuff is sort of part of the narrative of spectacle that science fiction has and that Star Wars, I think does really, really, really well. Um, in terms of sort of our world and technology, wow, I, I have never really, I always, I always see it in Star Trek. Mm. Um, watching the Star Trek shows is sort of like, oh yeah, we have that now. Oh yeah, we have that now. Oh yeah, we have that now. Um, well, I think, my, oh, go ahead. One of the things that I find interesting about Star Wars unlike Star Trek, is that Star Wars, Star Wars always looks back. The technology of Star Wars has a retro feel uh, with all, this, all these mechanical gears and things like that. While Star Trek is constantly thinking of what are we gonna have five centuries from now? And many art designers in Star Wars have always said this, like when we're looking for ideas, we go to World War II, we go to World War I, we go to the, um, we go to like 19th century technology. Star Wars is sort of like steam, steampunkish <laughs> in that sense that it's going back rather than looking forward. So, so Greg, it's a little hard for me to answer the question because I, I think of Star Wars as going the other way rather than thinking mm -hmm. of technology in the future. Well, I, I also think about the technology of, of, uh, of media making. Um, so like for instance, the Mandalorian using right. uh, kind of 180 LED screens where the, the actors are acting on the, right. the computer generated stage changes the way that we interpret it and changes the way it's created. Oh, that's true, that's true. And that's, that's yet another conversation about the use of technology in order to tell the story, in order to be able to, um, to sort of create the effect of where we are. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how, you know, during the prequel trilogy, by all the CGI that was inserted in there, some people were totally okay 
the old fans were sort of like we won material stuff. And so it's really, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky dialogue between the audiences and sort of the special effect team about what will work and what will not work. Um, and, and, and that's always been, even in animation, the different styles of animation of Clone Wars, Rebels and Resistance, um, and even now with, the, with Visions, with the anime, um, there's always a, a little bit of a gamble because Star Wars is very much about nostalgia very much about nostalgia and so there's this sort of notion that <laughs> this is the way star wars is and the moment it's tweaked there's this there's there's this moment of adjustment mm -hmm. for some people and a, and a moment of rejection for others and i think that the idea of special effects is very much connected to it mm. Um, I know you have uh, prepared a uh, short passage to read for us. Um, so I, we'll, we'll do a quick reading and then uh, maybe open it up to some questions from, from the audience. I see sure. um, Greg, Greg's responded that both aspects of his question was answered. So great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Greg. Um, I, I talked about nostalgia. This is a section that I talk a little bit about nostalgia. This is from the towards the end of the book. Um, and I just wanted to read a little section so you get a sense of the writing style and sort of the way I'm thinking about, about all of the things that Paul and I have been talking about. And Paul, this has been awesome. Like you're making me think about all sorts of things that I hadn't really put together. So it's, it's really <laughs> great well, to, to have that, another mind yeah. looking into my book. Cause like, it's like, okay, we, we have a second edition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for that. Star Wars is neither utopic nor dystopic. Its films, television shows, comics, and novels are not interested in depicting an idealized society, nor do they present an apocalyptic hell. Instead, the stories of Star Wars spring from the tension produced between these two worldviews, in the friction between the light and the dark side of the force, between authoritarianism and democracy, between war and peace, and between freedom and oppression. Even though the most repeated sentence in Star Wars is, I have a bad feeling about this, optimism permeates the multiverse, an optimism that good will win out. Star Wars pairs the threatening presence of war and destruction with a predilection for happy endings. John Williams' fanfare, which begins and ends all nine films of the Skywalker saga, is a musical expression of that hearten, heartening positivity. The odds are never good, as audiences realize in the first shot of A New Hope, the, the very first film, the 1977 film, when the rebel ship Tantive IV is dwarfed by a ginormous star destroyer that takes 11 seconds to fly over the camera but there is always the anticipation of an uplifting resolution. The trilogy format allows for dark sequences, which makes the happy endings all the more gratifying. But standalone films do this as well. Rogue One is a journey to hope, even if most of the characters ultimately perish in their successful mission to steal the plans of the Death Star. On television, the Clone Wars and Rebels are not afraid to portray the dire impact of war and totalitarianism, but they never fall into pessimism. The cynicism of Saw Gerrera, a character from Clone Wars and Rebels, is an exception. It is the optimism of Luke Skywalker or Ezra Bridger that is closer to the Star Wars ethos. Ezra keeps saying he wants to do the, what is right, an attitude that is as much American idealism as Jedi, and the multiverse encourages that attitude. As others have pointed out before me, in Star Wars, hope is it. The optimism of Star Wars is accompanied by a sense of innocence. The excitement of Annie in The Phantom Menace, the exuberance of the Ewoks after the Battle of Ender, Leia at the end of Rogue One with the Death Star's plan, plans in hands, the Force-sensitive young boy imagining a better future in the last scene of Last Jedi. This ingenious quality, however, never lasts long. Star Wars is fundamentally about the loss of innocence as characters face the consequences 
of not being truly aware of or in tune with the complexities of their world. That world is bent on refusing them a happy ending. The stories are about getting them there anyway. There's another tension in Star Wars that has to do with the act of experiencing the many layers of the multiverse. Watching the movies or reading the fiction, even cosplaying or making fan art, we experience a constantly shifting combination of entertaining distraction and critical engagement. Star Wars relies on spectacle, on cuteness, on badassness to draw audiences and readers back again and again and again. Similarly, Star Wars relies on nostalgia. A New Hope is a nostalgic mashup of Westerns, swashbucklers, war movies, and science fiction. Since the successful construction of the franchise, Star Wars has also become self-reflexively nostalgic, creating more narratives and more characters in more formats to help pass the fan torch from generation to generation. The Mandalorian functions as a nostalgia machine outside of its excellent storytelling and characterization. At the same time, the multiverse allows both newcomers and hardcore fans to meditate on what they experience. By consuming Star Wars, they are exposed to the complex social interactions of a huge variety of cultures, to the effects of dictatorial governments, and to the development of political consciousness. Perhaps Star Wars is not exactly a, a space of deep intellectual examination, but it can be a potent space for interpretation and discovery. And uh, I like that. I like that ending because it sort of wraps up many of the things that I'm talking about. It's not a spoiler. The conclusion doesn't have any spoils, but it's really interesting to sort of. I, I, I like that section because it wraps up many of the ideas that I've been talking about in the book. It's funny before uh, before we were chatting about how, the format of this, and and before you had said you wanted to read a passage, I I was going to pull out a passage to to ask you about, and that was the passage. <laughs> <laughs> with the optimism and the innocence. Yeah. Uh, because to me, there's such an interesting, one of the things I love about this book and one of the, the, the things that you, you helped me see Star Wars in a new light is we're, we're so used to seeing things in this binary. Yeah. But, but opening up Star Wars to look at this multiverse, it's shades of gray. It's not it's not a binary and and that I, I that has been remarkable so thank you for that um we do have a, a question from an anonymous attendee uh <laughs> who who writes uh i already know how unfair this question is but i want to know if you have any favorite characters from the broader universe not just the main characters uh in the films or any story arcs explored in the multiverse wow um i have two um, Ahsoka Tano from Clone Wars and Rebels, who briefly shows up in live action in Mandalorian. And I have a big soft spot for Thrawn from Grand Admiral Thrawn. Um, and especially because the different formats treat him in different ways. Um, the, the new novels that Timothy Zahn, the creator of Thrawn, um, has been writing recently doesn't treat him as a villain, as a villain. And it's really interesting to see somebody who has been historically seen as a villain um, being stories where he is fighting corruption, he is fighting piracy, he is fighting bureaucracy. <laughs> He's the good guy. He really is the good guy. Um, and so those two, those two are very special to me. Ahsoka, Ahsoka, I adore because she. She's so much like me. She's, she wants to belong to a, a system, to a structure, to an organization, and she can't quite do it. And that's me so much. Um, and I love, I love the story arc of Ahsoka um, very, very much. The other thing that I love is that I completely in love with a series of novels that were written during the prequel trilogy, prequel trilogy called Jedi Apprentice. And it's when Kenobi is 11 years old and he has no master. And Qui-Gon eventually becomes his master and they're the, their adventures. And those, they might be for 10 year olds, but those things are 
powerful and dramatic in ways I was not expecting a scholastic novel to do. I, I, I really was not. Um, and so that story arc of Kenobi as a, as a young Paduan, they're amazing. They're 20 amazing little novels that I am, I can't wait to read them again. Can't wait to read them again. How wonderful. Yeah, that's um, great. So, uh, the, please do keep posting your questions up to the Q&A. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask a question about, uh, this is maybe a more personal question, but how has Star Wars kind of changed your life? <laughs> wow. I, this is a big question, I know, but but I mean, you're, you're so uh, caught up in Star Wars. It's such a part of your life, you know, like mm -hmm. taking a step back. What have you pulled from it? What have you learned from it? Wow. I need like John Williams music in the background now. Oh, we should, we should find on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you two two answers, the sort of professional answer and the, and the sort of personal answer. The professional answer is that I, uh, this is the first time that I publish outside of my sort of official field of Latin American studies. And I have been wanting to do something like this for a very long time. And Star Wars gave me the confidence and the opportunity to write something that I am really proud of mm -hmm. um, and that I, that I managed to do beautifully. <laughs> and so it's really exciting that, that, I, have, that I have had that opportunity. Um, personally, I, I really like how Star Wars has grown up with me how when I was 11, they were these simple stories that, that told me about all sorts of things that I didn't know when I was 12. And as I grew up, it sort of grew with complexity. And you talked about shades of gray. Um, and I remember watching the Clone Wars television shows and it was one of these sort of like started very simple and it just gets more and more and more complex. And it was really wonderful to watch something that I was originally watching for nostalgic reasons because I saw the first movie when I was 12. And then I became completely involved in the complexity of the characters and the complexity of the stories. And so I'm glad that Star Wars, I am glad that Star Wars didn't stay like the 1977 version. I'm glad that Star Wars continues to evolve and change and sort of expand its layers. And so those are the two things for me. That's great. How, how, one, how wonderful, like what, a, what, a, what an amazing experience. Uh, we have another question from Greg. Um, the Nazi symbolism is obvious in the Star Wars universe, and you touched on it a bit in the book, but in today's culture, it's very relevant. Uh, were you thinking about that when you wrote the book? Was I thinking about present day? Uh, I, well, I, I guess were you so. thinking about present day, and were you thinking about the Nazi symbolism? Well, the, the interesting thing, there, there has been a lot of... Um, journals, articles, books, magazines um, about sort of the connections between sort of historical moments in our world and how they parallel with, with Star Wars and, you know, the whole, the whole Cold War mentality, the Nazi regime, the samurai films, all of those kinds of things are sort of very much connected to it. But more than that, I think I think Star Wars is a, a, a social and political reflection of the time that is producing it. And so indeed the Me Too generation has influenced the sequel trilogy, undoubtedly. Um, the, I remember, I, remember um, I don't remember who said it, but when they were about to finish the sequel trilogy, 
um, they were talking about the idea of totalitarianism, the, the idea of the end of democracy, um, 2017, 2016, 2018, 2019. And so we are, we were going in the United States through a, a radical change in how, how, how politics works. Um, and so the films are sort of connected to it, very much, very much connected to it. Um, and so I think, I think there's a, there's a political relevance to the way that the films are produced. I don't know that all the films and all the shows, I'm thinking more screen Star Wars, are, are necessarily making a direct commentary, but I think they are, in, they are a reflection of their time. They really are a reflection of their time. And I think that happens more with screen Star Wars than with fiction, for example. Fiction sort of has its own, its own little space. Um, yeah, that, the whole thing about baddies, about the attraction of the baddies, how there's like a huge section of the fan, fandom that is, you know, who cares about the Jedi? We want, we want Sith and Stormtroopers. Um, th that to me is very much connected to the politics of the time. Mm. Um, to me, that, that is part, that's sort of a gesture that is aligned with the side of the looser, the side of the, the notion of discipline and order and telling them what to do and all of that stuff. I think that's sort of connected to, to, to that idea. I mean, there are many reasons to love the Sith, um, but, but I think if, if you see it politically, Greg, then, then you might make some interesting connections in there too. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Joseph who wants to know, uh, would you call Star Wars feminist in any way or misogynist or is it both? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's, I, in the book, I say something like Star Wars is neither reactionary nor revolutionary when it comes to gender. I think that there are moments in which the films are suggesting very progressive notions of gender. Um, and there are moments in which the films, and I'm thinking more, more of the films now, um, are, are perpetuating traditional notions of gender. I'm thinking of Padme at the end of, of the prequel trilogy, with the pretty dresses brushing her hair, thinking about the baby's room. Uh, but I'm also thinking of Leia. I mean, Leia in 77, thanks to Carrie Fisher, um, created a character that was unique. Um, as I say in the book, before Leia is Jessica Lang in King Kong. And after Leia is, is Ripley in, in Alien. And so she is, she's this amazing threshold of this change, especially in like sci-fi and, and adventure films where, where a female character is completely changing the game, completely changing the game. And so Star Wars has that, but then it also has things like Padme and the, and in, the in the prequel trilogy. I, I don't know Wow, we're filming this. I'm so screwed. <laughs> I'm about to say something that I might regret tomorrow. Um, I wonder if the sort of progressive or slightly reactionary gestures have more to do with who is producing, who is directing, who is writing, uh, rather than thinking of Lucasfilm as a monolith or thinking about Disney as a monolith which those are huge mistakes, huge mistakes. And so I'm wondering if those kinds of things show up depending on who is in charge of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, it, it might depend, it might depend in that sense. I never thought about that, but that's, that's, that's an interesting way of thinking about mm -hmm. it. Do you, to, to get back to that question, do you see uh, misogyny in, in Star Wars at all? Or, or, because, uh, because I mean, you were talking about traditional gender roles, right? And traditional gender, but 
active misogyny you're talking active, about active, mis misogyny? active misogyny or or anything like that um i can't think of anything that is blatant um that's true uh because even in moments like you know when jabba the hot is exploiting women um we're not supposed to side with him it's not seen as that um but you know even 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 with the um with Leia's bikini in Return of the Jedi, the, the, um, the sort of photo shoots that were done with that costume are very exploitative. Mm -hmm. um, even in the film, even if the film, she's portrayed as a strong person who finally kills Jabba with the own chains of her slavery, um, the, all the photo sessions are, they're soft porn. <laughs> they really are. Um, and so it's not, absent mm -hmm. but it's not blatant it's well not i'm reminded um for a, for a long time one of the only toys of leia you could buy was in the bikini yeah true uh you couldn't buy general leia or anything like right. that That's so true so That's the, true. the marketing the mark marketing is maybe playing on our baser instincts whereas the creators are going or trying to go maybe a little bit in a different That's direction. true. And that's and, and you wrote about Leia, so you know about that. Um, and so it's really it would it would be really interesting to sort of get into the nitty-gritty of the difference between the storytellers and mm. sort of the marketing section of of advertising Star Wars outside. So that's that's another another yeah. really interesting element there. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. We're we're rapidly approaching uh the hour mark. holy bananas yes yeah yeah <laughs> um so feel free to pop those in the comments um i'll uh i'll i'll just kind of say just in a general sense um what what has the reception of the book been so far have you had feedback i, I have um it's been really fun sort of interacting with people on messenger and facebook and instagram and all of that um and it's been really interesting Sort of, I, I always thought of this book as a way of beginning a conversation about Star Wars. If you, if you buy the book, it's not very long. And so I can't say everything. And I didn't want to say everything. Um, but what has been really fun is that people read the book and then they come to me about this section or that example or that thing. Um, and so we've had some really interesting conversations about things that I that I had sort of mentioned in the book, but the readers would sort of run with it and so go a little further. Um, there was a woman in California that mentioned a moment in which I suggest that we might be able to think of Ray as a non-binary character. Uh, and we went into this really fascinating conversation about, well, can we also think about it as her expanding what femininity is rather than simply considering her a non-binary person? Um, and so we had this really interesting conversation about something that I was suggesting. I was not saying Ray is non-binary. I'm saying we could think of her that way. But she sort of started bringing all these other notions about sort of re rewriting femininity through Ray uh, rather than rather than discarding femininity and, and sort of creating this sort of non-binary notion. Um, and so it's, it's been really fun. Um, I, haven't, I haven't gotten anything like ridiculously toxic. Um, I think- yeah, just, wait till, just wait till this recording gets out there, Carmel. I know. Well, before, before the book came out, some idiot said, you know, could you please burn your house with the book in it and you in it? Uh, but that was even before the book came out, so I'm not going to worry about it. And you know, yeah. <laughs> you can, Wait, what, what can you do? What What can I do? What can I do? Uh, but everything has been really, really positive. I have been very excited um, talking, and it's really funny because you know there's been people that I, I have no idea who they are, and they sort of contact me. Um, mm -hmm. The other funny thing is that I've had a lot of can I buy the book and mail it to your house and you sign it for me and then mail it back to me and I'll pay you the shipping? Well, that's great. I think I've done that like 10 times already with wow. a few people I knew who they were. 
but others were sort of like, uh, sure. That's they just, wonderful. They just, they just put like cash inside the book <laughs> and they mail it to me. And, and so I used that cash to, to mail it back to them. Um, Star Wars, Star Wars fans love their autographs. So they, yeah. just, they just love that stuff. So. Well, we have we have one last question from Greg, who's been uh, our question uh, <laughs> maker. chat. Uh, it says, I'm not in tune with the Clone Wars as much as uh, in in your book, but you touch on it a lot. Is that your favorite aspect of the Star Wars universe? And I might just open that up to say, what is it? it did your favorite aspect of Star Wars change in the in the writing of this book? Oh, I would say, I would say that young adult novels and junior novels, I have a, a higher respect for them now after writing the book than I did before. Um, that was a discovery for me, a discovery for me. Um, I, I, I like Clone Wars a lot. I love Rebels more. Mm. I have a soft spot for rebels. Um, I, I, found it, I found it moving and exciting in sort of more layers. Um, when I, I've, I've seen rebels seven times, I've seen Clone Wars maybe four. And now when I see Clone Wars, there are a few episodes that I skip. Um, but with rebels, I just, I, I love watching them all. Um, but Clone Wars is amazing. Clone Wars is amazing. Like all television, it it, it takes a bit to pick mm -hmm. up. It, it just it just what happens with television uh, when you're when you're being episodic. You know, ask any Victorian novelist because you know television is Victorian novels turn into screen. Um, they it takes a while after those sort of weekly installments to get the story going. And so that's that's Rebels is my it's my baby. But I love the movie. I love everything. But but Rebels is dear to my heart. I love everything. I think is a great way to sum up <laughs> this talk. Carmelo, thank you so much for chatting with me about your book. It was so interesting. I feel like I've gotten such a great insight, not only into kind of the book, but also you and, and your fandom. And I, I have loved the way that you approached my book. I, it was, it's like I'm seeing my book with new eyes with all of the questions that you posed. I didn't take any notes, but <laughs> probably should have uh, because it was really fun to see a very different take, a very different take on, on what I was trying to say in the book. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for attending everyone. Um, please do pick up a copy of the book. Yes, and I think there's a way, there's a way that, um, maybe through, your, through this link where you can place the order and pick it up. And maybe Matt can give us a little bit of information. He just showed up there as a little angel on top of my screen. <laughs> yes, and we'll... <laughs> I've never once been described that way in any of these events. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, just popping in again to thank both of you for sharing this conversation with, uh, with us tonight, for choosing on a bridge to, to host this. And to remind everybody that yes, that um, email invite that you were sent has a link where you can go directly to our website. And you don't have to have all the back and forth with cash and envelopes. You can just order the book straight from us. We've got them signed here. There you um, go. There you go. Signed in stock so that we can streamline the process. Just order the book signed from us. We'll get it to you. You can pick it up here in the store. We can ship it to you whichever <laughs> way. Um, but yes, again, thank you everybody for joining us tonight for this. Thank you, Carmelo. Thank you, Paul. Oh, um, no. Thank you. Event. Thank you. Yeah. Um, buy the book. Get Star Wars Multiverse. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thank good night. Good night.